Please welcome Pioneer's Chair and Professor of Telecommunications at Penn State University, Dr. Christopher Ali. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for having me today, and a particular thanks to Chris James for his friendship. It is an absolute honor to be in front of you today at my very first res, having a great time, and the opportunity to get to share some of my research today. My goal for my 10 minutes is to get us all fired up about broadband and a connected future. Before I get started, however, I want to acknowledge that the land on which we gather is the ancestral and unceded territory of the Nuuvi, Southern Paiute people, and the Las Vegas Paiute tribe. I'm Canadian originally from Winnipeg, Woo! Woo! which is Treaty 1 territory and traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, and Diné peoples, and the national homeland of the Red River Métis. And I want to acknowledge all of the Canadian-based First Nations people here today. Go Canada. So my work and my research, which is published in my book, Farm Fresh Broadband, The Politics of Connectivity, Politics of Rural Connectivity, asks why rural and remote communities are still unconnected, despite decades of deployment and billions of dollars spent. And of course, the digital divide is so much more than just rural. It impacts cities and towns and suburbs and indigenous communities. It is a matter of access. It is a matter of affordability, of knowledge, and of support. Today, we can't stop talking about broadband. Every day, dozens of articles are published about broadband, what communities are doing to connect themselves, why folks are un- and under-connected, what technologies are being deployed, and what governments are doing to bridge what's called the digital divide. But if we're being grim about the whole situation, the reason why we're all talking about broadband is because so many people don't have it. This includes millions of folks predominantly in rural, remote, and indigenous communities who don't have access to a network at all, even more who have access to a network but are underconnected and can't do what they want to do with the internet, and tens of millions of people in this country who can't afford a broadband subscription. So what exactly is this thing called broadband? Broadband is affordable, high-speed internet connectivity that allows us to participate in digital life. It anticipates future needs and usage. It is about the skills and literacy to know how to use our networks and our website. It is usually brought to us by cables and from telecommunications companies, and of course, everybody wants fiber optics. Some of us are connected wireless three, through fixed wireless or satellite networks. And for a small minority, broadband is mobile only. There's a small population who can only access the internet through their smartphones. And as we're talking about today, broadband is absent in so many rural, remote, and indigenous communities. In fact, 42 million people in this country lack access to a broadband network. Broadband is also unevenly distributed for millions in rural, remote, and indigenous communities. In fact, up to 120 million Americans, according to Microsoft, lack access to the internet at broadband speeds. Broadband is also unaffordable for millions. Here's an interesting fact. We here in the United States pay the most for internet access out of any country in the developed world. I was reflecting this morning on Chris James's wonderful introductory speech yesterday and his reminder to us that the RES 2023 theme is empowering for generations. Broadband helps us achieve this goal. If it is available, affordable, and used, broadband contributes to economic development, to education, to health, to civic engagement, to cultural connections, public safety, and quality of life. After all, if there is one thing the pandemic taught us, is that broadband is essential to contemporary life. In fact, the United Nations called access to the internet a matter of life and death. 
We learned during the pandemic that those with broadband at home are more likely to social distance. We learned that students with a broadband connection will probably have half a letter grade GPA higher than those without broadband. We also heard stories of folks having to drive to the parking lots of McDonald's and libraries to get connected. The pandemic was a wake-up call for our digital life. You know, as I was flying here, I was finishing Ben Tarnoff's new book, Internet for the People, and was absolutely struck by a sentence and that I had to share it with all of you. Connectivity is a precondition for the possibility of a self-determined life. Wow. Imagine the possibilities of connected communities. Imagine the empowerment for our young people when they're connected. On the flip side, I want to share a story from, with you from my research in an unconnected county in Southern Virginia. In 2020, Surrey County, Virginia was the least connected county in the state. It was a desert for so many reasons, a broadband desert and a news desert. And my colleague Nicholas Matthews and I spent time speaking with people of the, of the county, and one of the things that we learned was that life in a broadband desert is defined by waiting. Waiting for an internet service provider to come. Waiting for that buffering to stop so you can watch your Netflix. And for one family, waiting until midnight so that they could start their digital life. So that their network connections would be fast enough to be able to do their schooling and their house and their work. They called themselves a second shift family, where work and school and downloading would all begin after midnight. A second shift family. My friends, it should be our goal to make sure that there are no more second shift families in this country. During the height of the pandemic, President Biden said that broadband is the next electricity. On the surface, this sounds like a pretty fair declaration, right? Broadband today is as important as electricity was yesterday. But there's so much more to that. In the 1930s, we had a plan to connect every corner of this country. Today, we lack that plan. So to me, saying that broadband is the next electricity is a provocation to ask, how do we get connected? Of course, another reason that we can't stop talking about broadband is that there's a ton of money that is about to flow down the proverbial pipes. $65 billion, in fact, stemming from the 2021 Infrastructure Act and divided into a couple of programs. And this afternoon, I'm going to be walking us through how we can access some of that money to help our communities. So what's the next steps for our connected future? Well, states are preparing to receive billions of dollars in broadband and digital equity funds. They're establishing broadband offices, they're creating deployment and digital equity plans, they're reaching out to communities, and communities need to assess their own digital needs and gaps. Digital champions have never been more important. And digital navigators, like librarians and community center workers, are the new heroes of connectivity because they are now being trained to help us with our digital troubles. The future of connectivity, my friends, is all about community. So I've only got about a minute left, and I want to beg your indulgence and reiterate the importance of broadband by reading to you the last paragraph of my book, because I think it sums up everything quite nicely. So here we go. I am continually struck by something that Bernadine Jocelyn director of public policy and engagement at Minnesota's Blandin Foundation, told me in her interview for this book, everything is better with better broadband. I repeat it here and throughout this book to shed a clear, bright light on a complex issue. This is not a technologically determinist argument. The mere existence of broadband in a rural community is not going to solve inequality, although the lack of it certainly doesn't help. Instead, I invoke this phrase to demonstrate how broadband, rural broadband and broadband policy are lived and experienced or not on the ground in rural communities throughout the country. Broadband policy such as it is may be written in Washington with the legal prose refined at the headquarters of AT&T, uh, Frontier, CenturyLink, Verizon and Windstream, 
but it has lived in Laverne, Minnesota, McKee, Kentucky, and Mineral, Virginia. At its furthest reach, <coughs> Jocelyn's phrase parallels conversations occurring at the United Nations and the European Union about whether internet access can be called a human right, akin to the rights to information, education, and information. Closer to home, it reminds us that at the end of the day, broadband is not about policy, politics, technology, or money. It is about people. When deployed democratically and harnessed inclusively, everything can be better with better broadband. From homework to work to health to talking with grandma. Everything is better with better broadband is a call to end the rural-urban digital divide and the multitude of digital divides brought on by inequality in the United States. Thank you very much for your time and have a wonderful conference.